So this week, there are two banks that closed down very close to each other, uh, Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and before we kind of like get into the nitty gritty details, like who are these guys and like who are their customers? Yeah. So so not just two banks, but actually three banks. Silvergate mm -hmm. Bank also went down uh, just before Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. But essentially, uh, Silvergate, they were a large bank that was doing institutional uh, funds and deposits for cryptocurrency companies. Uh, and so they were one of the major banks behind Circle's inter-exchange network. Um, and then there was also uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which is a major bank among Silicon Valley startups and startups throughout America. And essentially, uh, while they have a large venture debt portfolio, so they, they lend funds to startups who have raised a certain amount of money and have a certain amount of revenue that uh, comes in reasonably reliably. Uh, you know, they also had a number of assets tied up in long-term bonds after COVID. Um, and so they had some weakness in their balance sheets from that. Um, so Signature Bank is a similar issue. They also uh, are part of the inter-exchange network at Circle. Um, and they were, uh, both Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Signature were storing some funds for USDC, um, the cryptocurrency token that represents the US dollar uh, that's widely used on Coinbase and on DeFi protocols. And uh, so there were some worries there where if those banks went under that uh, USDC wouldn't be fully capitalized. And so, you know, the peg might break. And so we actually did see uh, that peg weaken down to 88 cents, I believe was the worst it got. Um, very briefly, um, but now it's back strong as ever. Nice. Um, so what is it about like the environment we're in now that like these large banks couldn't anticipate this or they couldn't like write the ship in time? Uh, like how did they get caught in this situation? Yeah. So, you know, obviously as a bank, your number one job is to lend money to people. Uh, and to store deposits for people. So when you as a customer go to a bank and you deposit money with them, the bank can turn around and take some fraction of that, uh, usually about 90%. Um, during COVID, they could take 100% of it and, and loan it out to people um, in order to help stimulate the economy and help people make ends meet. Um, but a, a bank lends out that money. And so it's not always available when you want to go and withdraw that money from the bank. So, you know, usually that's fine. Most of the time people have a small amount of the currency that they're holding at the bank that they need at any given time. And uh, so having 10% of that cash sitting on hand is usually enough. But if enough people get scared at the same time and they all go to withdraw money at the same time from the bank, then the bank has to start unwinding some of their other positions that they've lent your cash into. Um, so, you know, during COVID, it was a very low interest rate environment. The, you know, we wanted people to be borrowing money. We wanted people to be spending it. And so we, uh, in order to stimulate the economy and to keep people participating in the market instead of hoarding their cash and causing prices to skyrocket, we wanted people to continue paying each other. And so, uh, for that reason, the U.S. government made interest rates really low and, uh, you know, took away the, a lot of the incentives for keeping your money on hand in a bank. And so when that happens, banks will generally try and uh, offset their balance sheet by being in uh, some of these more long term investments that may pay a better rate than what is currently being paid right now. And so, you know, in 2020, there was some guidance from the Fed that said, yeah, interest rates are going to be low for a while, uh, you know, at least for the next three years. So if you take some of these short term positions, um, then you can generally trust that those instruments are going to be as worth uh, as much three years from now as they are now. And unfortunately, that was not the case. We obviously we started experiencing hyperinflation to a large extent last year. We had inflation of eight, nine percent. Um, 
uh, overall. And, you know, on average in a year, you want it to be about 2% is what the, the target is. So, you know, that's four times what it should be. And that half percent rate for 10 year treasury bonds skyrocketed to 4.7% uh, is, is what it started paying recently. And I think it's even higher than that right now, or, or was before the FDIC, uh, you know, stepped in. And so, uh, when that happens, because you can buy new bonds that are paying much better rates, the old bonds, uh, if you want to get out of them because you don't have 10 years to stick around to wait for the money to accrue, it, they'll be worth less. So instead of being able to wait for 10 years and get the full value of the bond back, you have to sell it now at a discount. And, uh, you know, what was $100 may only be worth $87 or $85. And so the more people come to the bank and say, hey, can I have my money back? Then the more of these you have to sell and the less overall money you have on hand to, to give back to everybody. And so at that point, you become insolvent and uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has to step in and uh, back your deposits or they have to let you fail. That's interesting. So it's it's you almost get stuck in these long term investments, right? And is that why the government is willing to help? Is because hey, our guidance two years ago suggested that this would be a good move, and now it's not. Yeah, I mean, there is a certain amount of uh, you know we created our own problem here, um, and uh, you know Frank, who is the guy behind the Dodd Frank Act, uh, that you know, increase the regulations after 2008, the finance, the great financial crisis. Um, he was on the board of signature and, uh, mm. you know, he said, Hey, looking at the balance sheet, I don't think that signature should have been shut down. I think that, uh, this was probably premature. Um, but, uh, in, in that sense, a lot of people were caught by surprise uh, by this changing interest rate environment and and the uh, resolution of of these banks was a surprise. And and so if the U.S. government allows that to spread and, uh, you know, some of these smaller banks that have more vulnerable balance sheets that, uh, you know, they may not have the resources of J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, if they start to get caught up and their depositors start to lose their funds, then that could quickly cascade out of control and cause another recession. And so, you know, it, the, the FDIC very uh, you know, intelligently moved quickly and and uh, decided to pay the full face value of all of those bonds um, mm -hmm. in advance, essentially, instead of waiting to pay them out over time so that they could guarantee all of the funds that are in the accounts at Signature SVB and Silvergate. Uh, so like diving into Signature a little bit, like on the it was on a Sunday, the 12th, uh, there was an announcement made that regulators chose to shut down Signature. Um, why would why would a regulator choose to do that? Yeah, well, so that's a great question. Uh, if if you do ask uh, Mr. Frank, he, he says that uh, really they shouldn't have and, and that the balance sheet was healthy and uh, there wasn't as much risk of a run as there was at SVB. Um, but there is some speculation to suggest that, uh, you know, because Silvergate and Signature were both uh, very important infrastructural banks for cryptocurrency, that this was uh, possibly a maneuver to to uh, show the federal government's displeasure with cryptocurrency and and to try and scare people away from from acting with it. But uh, you know there there were some balance sheet issues that that could have gone gotten out of control. Um, and in this case, it was actually the state regulator of Signature Bank that decided to shut them down. But it is interesting that the FDIC decided to include that in their announcement on, on Sunday uh, regarding the uh, SVB uh, implosion and, and the actions that the FDIC was going to take to uh, backstop that. Hmm. So like when a bank is closed down, what are the actual like actions that happen? You know, we have their, your depositors, and then we also have people who've invested in the bank. Like, what does that actually look like for these stakeholders involved? 
Yeah. So in general, uh, the bank will be put up for an auction process over the weekend. Yeah, the FDIC is very experienced at doing this. The, these are the first banks that have failed since 2020 um, over the last three years. And, and I think SVB was the third largest bank that is, has failed uh, in such a fashion uh, in American history for as long as the FDIC has been uh, around. So, you know, this was a pretty rare event. And the FDIC had to move in quickly to to handle it. So usually what happens is over the weekend, there will be an auction process where other large banks will be able to bid on the assets of the smaller bank. Uh, and then the new ownership will come in on Monday and essentially guarantee all of the assets of the uh, previous uh, owner, the, pre the previous bank. And in this case, uh, the FDIC actually set up a uh, bridge corporation that will acquire all of the Silicon Valley Bank assets, and uh, they'll give an advance to all of the uh, all the corporations and individuals who are holding currency greater than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, the FDIC limit. Um, now and so mm -hmm. people will receive at least 50 percent of those funds and then uh they may be paid back over time and they would get access to those funds um but it sounds like pretty much everything is operating as normal now um essentially the bridge corporation came in and acquired the assets and just continued to run it as if they had uh you know full face value of of their bonds and currency because uh you know essentially the fdic said that they would provide that so uh, just to like jump to Silicon Valley Bank for a second, and I'm not sure if this is correct. Like you'll have to correct me if it's not, but the acquisition of that was for like one euro or one dollar, something like that, right? Uh, I, didn't see the, I didn't see the acquisition price, but uh, it, it would not be surprising if that was the case. So if let's just say that it like hypothetically, if that was the case, like what happens to the investors who – you know, maybe they're not like a depositor at the bank, but they've invested money in like the bank as an entity. What what happens to them or the value of, of what they put in? Yeah, well, so it entirely depends on what the acquisition deal is, right? If the acquisition deal is that they purchase uh, SVB for $1, and then uh, all of the assets of SVB will convert into assets of the new bridge corporation, then essentially the investors are made whole in that way because uh, you know they continue to own a share of this new bank that essentially owns all the assets of the old bank. Um, but if, if the deal is different, if, if the deal is that uh, you know, they'll be able to redeem shares on some uh, fraction of what they had previously uh, in order to make room for the new owners, then obviously they're going to take a haircut uh, mm -hmm. on, on that deal. So, uh, you know, in general, if if the federal government does have to step in, usually the shareholders are the ones who have to pay. Um, and in this case, the taxpayers are also going to have to pay over time through inflation because essentially, instead of waiting to pay out these bonds over the next 10 years, we're all going to pay them out now. Um, mm. And so, you know, as a society, we are going to share the cost of that um, either via inflation or some other uh, purely monetary mechanism. So I know we always point to like 2008 because that's the most recent like very large crisis for us uh but does this point to or mirror something like even further in the past or some other kind of crisis like have we seen this kind of thing before uh to some extent right uh you know in the 80s we also had uh hyperinflation and we did have a lot of weakness in bond markets and and things of that nature but this is really the first time that we've seen this sort of rapid interest rate change yeah and you know cryptocurrency just in itself is a new uh a new thing to this like what kind of impact do you think this has on cryptocurrency just like as an ecosystem itself yeah, well, I, you know, we did see uh, a bit of a pump in Bitcoin and Ethereum of 15% of over the weekend because people were trying to withdraw their USDC and, and uh, redeem that for, for other currencies. And so the fear there was great enough that it caused large movements in the market. But in reality, when you looked at the, uh, you know, underlying 
uh, fundamentals of, okay, there's about 38, 39 billion of uh, US dollars that have been converted into USDC, because in order to mint a USDC, they have to receive a US dollar and put it into a vault somewhere. Um, and three and a half billion of that was tied up at Silicon Valley Bank. So, you know, 30, three and a half billion divided by 39 billion is about, uh, you know, uh, 8%. And so that means that the value of USDC should go down by 8%. But people had additional fear of, okay, what if signature goes down? What if, uh, you know, GSV says uh, that they're not going to uh, take USDC anymore and uh, Coinbase shut down trading on the coin over the weekend. So there were a lot of fearful things going on in the market that said, well, maybe USDC can depeg. And if it depegs, then how does that affect the rest of the currency? Because so much of the volume in the market occurs on USDC pairs. So, you know, it certainly reveals a vulnerability to the cryptocurrency ecosystem that so much of the market relies on this single point of failure um, in terms of having a a version of U.S. dollars that can be traded on distributed currency networks. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, I think that's the lesson that we should take away as an industry is, is that, uh, you know, we probably want to have a more diversified approach to stable coins um, and especially, you know, fully backed reserve stable coins uh, as opposed to imputed value stable coins like DAI or FRX, uh, where you're holding a certain amount of collateralized Ethereum uh, or other currencies. And so, uh, you know, that is a big takeaway from this is, is that our industry isn't as independent of the dollar as we think. Um, and, and certainly we should hope that, uh, you know, God forbid there's a recession or, or some other major economic impact that, uh, you know, we have ways to facilitate people transitioning onto crypto uh, and back into U.S. dollars as needed. Speaking of uh, single points of failure, uh, you know, a lot of analysts are talking about Silicon Valley Bank uh, and kind of having the message of this is, you know, the first large one we've seen in such a long time that there are going to be some after effects or it's going to affect other institutions. Um, like how big is Silicon Valley Bank in relation to, you know, everybody else who's out there and, and how potentially harmful could that could this event be to them? Yeah, well, so I, I think they had a uh, bond portfolio of 35 billion and a venture debt portfolio of about 500 million. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things as a bank, they're, they're not JP Morgan, which is holding in the hundreds of billions, um, but they're, they're a significantly sized bank. Um, and, you know, more importantly, they were a sectorally significant bank. So a lot of Silicon Valley firms and, and high tech products were storing a lot of money at Silicon Valley Bank. And so if they went down and and they were unable to redeem the assets of these startups that hold 10 million, 15 million, uh, you know, that means that they can't make payroll to their uh, 100 employees, their 50 employees. Um, and so that adds up. Uh, over time, and, and that makes it a, a systemically important bank. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the contagion that was a risk for Silicon Valley Bank is that all of these businesses would suddenly go out of business and then all of their employees wouldn't have uh, income anymore. And so that could quickly cascade out. And the fear now for the regional banks is that they have similar weaknesses on their balance sheets. But now you're hearing about retail customers who are also worried because, uh, you know, these businesses weren't able to uh, give them uh, their payroll. I went to my dentist two days ago and they said that they were affected by this, that that they couldn't make payroll because, you know, some uh, payroll company ha was banking at Silicon Valley Bank. And so because the payroll company was banking there, they couldn't actually process their payroll to the their customers, even though, you know, they were on Chase and Wells Fargo. So, mm. 
you know, the, the system is interconnected. And anytime you have a large disruption of this kind, you never know where the blockages are going to show up. And, uh, you know, if it causes fear in the average citizen on the street and they start to withdraw from their banks, then that could cause a, a cascading bank run that, that causes a lot of institutions to run down uh, and, and wind down in what's called contagion. Mm. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the way Silicon Valley Bank uh, offered products was unique. Like all this, uh, this kind of narrative has come out like after. Uh, what is it about them of what they offered that was so different than, you know, like another bank or what made them unique in that way? Yeah, I mean, mainly it's just that they, they had a slightly higher risk appetite when it came to uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs. So, you know, they're their bread and butter was if you are a small company and you raise a $10 million round, then they would come to you and say, hey, if you keep $2 million with us, we'll extend to you this line of credit and, uh, you know, you'll be able to borrow against the full amount of the $10 million that you raise and we'll also give you loans against the stock in your company. So, you know, if you can't pay back our loan, then we'll just acquire your stock and we think that's probably a pretty good bet. Now, overall, that was a small portion of their portfolio compared to, uh, you know, the long term bonds that that changed rates and, and lost value um, if they had to liquidate. But, you know, when a lot of your customers are relying on a high interest rate environment or, or sorry, a low interest rate environment and suddenly you change to a high interest rate environment, then that causes weakness in your customers. And then your customers have to withdraw and some of the bets that you made. Uh, aren't as good, and and so that ends up being double the risk than you in, that intended to take. And so, uh, you know, because of their specific customer base, they had more exposure to these changing interest rate environments than perhaps they had uh, originally thought in their risk analysis. Mm. Do you think that this event, you know, I know we talked about uh, kind of like the mechanisms regulators use to try to you know, influence the market one way or another. Will this event in itself, do you think, uh, lead to different regulations or some kind of uh, something in the future? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, the the FDIC is is cha considering changing the maximum coverage now, which hasn't happened since 2008. Um, it's very likely that new uh, institutions will be created to sort of manage these interest rate changes and and to uh, talk about them from a policy perspective. Um, you know, a lot of these policy changes have been in response to inflation and in, in response to the necessary, uh, you know, help that was given to Americans around the country during COVID who had lost their jobs or who were not considered, uh, you know, systemically important workers. Um, and so were unable to go to work uh, or the landlords who, you know, had to give free rent essentially and while still maintaining the businesses and the companies that they were a part of or the PPP loans that were given out. There was a lot of money that was printed to help the country through COVID. And now we're seeing the effects of that through the inflation. And because of the inflation, now the uh, sort of messed up balance sheets of these banks. And so uh, definitely there's going to be a long, hard look at some of our policies and some of the ways that we can try and mitigate these ripples that occur from those big activities in the future. And, you know, when we uh, first started talking about this, it was maybe like a week ago. And even just in the time it's been uh, from a week ago to now, it seems like the waters are a lot more calm. Like, um, is there a sense that, like, we're all going to be OK out of this thing or uh, what's why is that? Why does it feel like that? Well, I, I mean, the the Fed acted quickly, right? Uh, they, we have a backstop. We have a solution. It's going to be expensive in the grand scheme of things, but it's it's a solution that w we would have had to pay over the next 10 years anyway. And so essentially, just as a society, we're saying we're going to take the hit now uh, so that we can prevent this catastrophic event that might cause even worse uh, problems for people in general. And hopefully we can nip this thing 
nipping in the bud and prevent a larger recession uh, by just, you know, taking the pain now via taxes or inflation or or via shareholder loss of value. Um, and so, you know, somebody has to, to pay for it, um, but the, it's a better idea for everyone to accept a little of the pain now than to force a few people to accept a lot of the pain now and then cascade that out because you might end up with a worse catastrophe than, than uh, you know, whatever pain we're willing to accept now. And uh, I feel like there's uh, definitely some some case to be made here as far as the difference between cryptocurrency and traditional finance, uh, as far as like holding value in banks versus Bitcoin digitally, where, you know, you know, Bitcoin has a fixed amount that will, uh, will ever be created. Right. Uh I don't know, like you can kind of like once you get a little look under the hood, you see how complex our economy is, you know, the banking system is uh, as far as individuals go. Um, I don't know, like if we if we had a reserve currency that was like Bitcoin or some kind of digital asset that was like a fixed amount, um, would we still have like the flexibility to do all of these kinds of things or would it be a very much more rigid environment? You know, it's a good question, right? That That is a lot of the speculation now is that uh, maybe the U.S. government feels that uh, USDC and USDT and all of these uh, stable coins that are being minted off of uh, real U.S. dollars should be under one roof. And, uh, you know, Binance, they issued a program where essentially if you deposit any USD stable coin at Binance, they'll just convert it, convert it into Binance USD. Um, and so one could easily see a version of the future where the U.S. government offers a simple, uh, a similar institution where they'll take all stable coins and convert them into the U.S. stable coin and uh, one that the U.S. has full control over and who can transact in it. Um, and so, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, enforcement you can do if that's if that's the direction you want to take. But I think there will always be other stable coins out there, other versions of the U.S. dollar now that it's possible. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing to stop someone from saying, sure, I'll print a token on your behalf. Just give me some real U.S. dollars and I'll, I'll take your U.S. dollars and you can take my uh, USD imputed token to your local decentralized exchange where anyone else is willing to take it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think it's going to be very difficult for the central banking digital currencies to take over, but certainly they can make it much more difficult for these other alternatives to exist. And they can try and compete on, on a level of innovation where, you know, if because you're transacting in the official U.S. dollar coin and not, uh, you know, circles USDC, then maybe you get advantages to that. You pay less in taxes or you, you get certain social social credits, uh, much like the Chinese program. Um, mm -hmm. So there are many ways that that can turn dystopian, but there are many <laughs> ways that can be a good deal for people. And as long as governments are willing to, uh, you know, try and compete on being a, a better deal instead of on being a, a more uh, frightening deal, uh, as the alternative might be, I think that, you know, we can build a better, healthier ecosystem of alternatives. Yeah. And so much of our money, like we don't, when we talk about printing money, like it's not like we're printing cash money. Most of it is digital money already, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, under the hood, really banks making loans is how we print money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we talked earlier about how the reserve requirement in the United States is 10% on it on average over the years. And so, you know, that means that a bank can loan 10 times as much money as they have on hand in order to create value in the ecosystem. And, you know, when you give a loan to someone, you don't know whether or not they're going to pay that loan back. You just make an assessment. You say, well, I think this person's trustworthy. They have a good business plan. I think, uh, you know, I've seen other deals like this and they've tended to return this kind of money. So we're going to give you this interest rate based on the risk that 
that we see in your deal. And uh, we think that you will create that much value. And so, you know, that is how we create more money in the system generally is that we have entrepreneurs and uh, young business owners, small business owners who want to create something and create value. And the banks, they believe in them or, or investors believe in them. And so they literally create money out of thin air to give this person because they think they're going to pay it back in 10 years. Man, that is fascinating. Uh, it's it, very interesting to hear it laid out uh, like that. Uh, that's a good way to put it. Well, uh, I know like when all this stuff kind of uh, started last week, we definitely needed to get you on camera and go, run through this. I love the way you describe these things. Um, anything else you'd say about this situation or anything coming up? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's all the usual stuff of uh, if if you have more money than the FDIC limit, then you know, congratulations. Good job. Uh, but, you know, think carefully about where you choose to store that that money uh, over the FDIC limit. Uh, and, you know, if if you're banking at a regional bank, you you may want to keep some amount of funds at a larger bank as well, just so that you can diversify your holdings and make sure that, uh, you know, God forbid something goes wrong with one of the institutions that you're holding money at, you have a backup and, and that you always have access. And, you know, if one of those locations is cryptocurrency where you can hold it yourself, then that's not a bad idea either. Um, it, you know, in general, you want to have as many options as possible in case the worst happens. And, uh, you know, there are plenty of ways to do that, that allow you to grow with the market or to hold it in stable currency that, that will maintain its value at the same rate, uh, as other equivalent currencies. Awesome. Well, solid advice as always, uh, appreciate you. And, uh, yeah, I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we'll capture you on the next one, man. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, right. good, good luck out there. Thank you. Thank you. I need it. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs>